Açıldı mı? Merhaba, zannediyorum yayındayız şu anda. Ee, Saşa'nın girişini bekliyorum. Ee, odasının görselindeyiz. Açıldı mı? The second. Well, I'm trying to figure out. So I entered the room. It is like a lecture room. Okay, great. Okay, now we are live. We started. Okay, wonderful. And one second. Ah, yes, indeed. I have to do the live. Yeah, we started. Okay. So let me prepare the stuff. And yes, I just best last bits of uh, uh, home keeping here. Okay, yes. All right, people are seeing your screen from your iPad right now. Okay, very good. Yes, uh, something stuck around here. Yes, okay. It doesn't matter much. So I'm trying to do, uh, I hope it is uh, not what see my people, yes? Uh, th they do, they do. They do, okay, They're pretty strange. Okay, what to do? I have to, ah, uh, yes, indeed, sorry. Uh, You could just uh, put your finger on the camera of the iPad. Okay, yes. Yeah, you started broadcasting now. I started That's broadcasting now. Okay, yes, indeed. Yes. And what is going in this broadcast? Let me open. Yes, well, what I'm trying to open, I'm trying to open this thing. All right, and I'll just introduce you. To... Yes, please. So I'm ready, yes? Yes. Okay, you great. Are. Sorry for all these technical mishaps. Well, yeah, we are all going through some uh, technical trials of our own uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. We are with Alexander Sasha Borovic. Uh, now, we have announced this live stream before, uh, so we will be talking about the uh, mathematics education in Soviet Russia, not just the uh, formal education, but the extra pieces uh, of mathematics you can reach uh, before. Uh, so welcome, Sasha, to our live stream. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and being with us here today. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure for me to um, uh, give this talk and in a new, completely new medium of communication for me. I never before did last live broadcasts on YouTube. And a number, a number of my friends who are watching it now are perhaps quite curious how I will be struggling with that. <laughs> but uh, thanks to Cubra, I hope that actually we will go uh, quite smoothly. Uh, but let us see. So I want to give a talk on mathematics education in Soviet Russia. And uh, uh, and uh, make some parallels with what we see in Turkey now. Okay, thank you. I, so you will start with your uh, presentation from your tablet, I think. Yes. All right, your yes, screen okay. is live. In this case, I, I have to show the uh, uh, their stuff, yes. Mm -hmm. This is the title, Mathematics Education in Soviet Russia. And I have to learn to page its stuff. I will start with the standard introduction which I already several times gave at the beginning of my talks in mathematics. Uh, it is about what are the uses of mathematics, why mathematics is useful. 
Why mathematics is useful, specifically in a situation where 95% of people who say the truth do not need any mathematics in their lives? I hear these questions even at uh, meetings on mathematics education, where professors, specialists in mathematics education, ask the audience, dear colleagues, who of you lately had to add three sevenths and five eighths? <laughs> Nothing about subtraction of fractions. So this is the problem. Uh, if you ask normal people, who are we, them last, when any of them last time used logarithms? For example. Well, oh, I have not. You have not, yes, me too. Well, actually I used the general concept of logarithm, interestingly, but not computations with logarithms. And this is a very interesting point to which I will return later. So it is normally claimed that mathematics is useful. The problem is that anyone benefit from mathematics regardless of whether he or she knows mathematics or not. Mathematics hardwired in mobile phones is beyond understanding of most mathematics graduates from British universities. And there are more mobile phones in the world now than toothbrushes. Well, this is a fact that I learned from you last yes. time you gave this talk and it's amazing. Oh, yes, indeed. So for that reason, we benefit, but this mathematics is carefully hidden from us. We're using it as we use electricity. Most people have no idea what electricity is. They see only that it boils a kettle, fries a sausage, Well, and of course, this thing immediately started to, to look. I think you might be hitting the button on the uh, side of the iPad. Oh, uh, maybe, okay. Let me do this a bit more careful. Uh, so let us continue, okay? There is another thesis, mathematics is beautiful. It deserves a bit more attention. It is useful to compare uh, mathematics with music. Even more this musical skills change person's appreciation of music. I'll try to demonstrate to you something similar in mathematics. This is a classical example of a traditional example of a beauty in mathematics and which actually sits in my spleen, you know, and uh, I hate it. Uh, Self-similarity, it means that pattern repeats itself again and again and again in smaller and smaller scale. And this picture repeat themselves again, again and again in social media. As try to, you find something about mathematics, you inevitably see this stuff. What is wonderful? that people could be surprised by that, can maybe enjoy that, I don't. But almost no one understands what it is. What it is? It is a mathematical object. How it is defined, how it is constructed. What are his properties? Why it is uh, uh, of some interest in mathematics? Well, the interest in mathematics can be explained by interest of uh, physicists to this stuff. This is a classical woodcut uh, from 19th century Japan. The Great Wave of Kanagawa from the 336 views of Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji is somewhere here. No, it is seen on the horizon between the waves. However, when you look at the wave, you discover that it uh, is done with a remarkable uh, pattern of fractal nature. The same uh, pattern repeats again and again at smaller way, at a smaller scale. 
huge wave, smaller waves. These waves are broken in even smaller waves, and it goes that way. This is a, a patterns of similarity of uh, in turbulence, in turbulent movement of water or gas. And interestingly, one of the remarkable contributions to uh, study of turbulence was made by a person whose name will be mentioned in my talk, Andrei Kalmogorov, the famous Russian mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians in history. He was a theoretical mathematician, but he also studied turbulence, uh, studied turbulence. Well, now I will demonstrate to you two so similar mathematical expressions. One with nested radicals, another with nested fractions. They look basically very much like what we can find in nature, these leaves of spleenwort fern. Let us try to understand why this is happening. Let us capture the self-similarity with mathematics. When you look at this expression for x in the top line of formula, you see that starting from, and maybe I need now to start uh, using pen, which I did just a few seconds ago. And let me try, maybe I will manage to do this again. Does it work? Okay, pen does not work on my screen, my apologies. Kubra is a witness that it did work. Okay. Yeah, I it did actually. <laughs> yes, I, I will continue with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, without pen. I can briefly describe. If you look at the formula for X, you see that it includes under that, under the biggest square root, one plus, again, infinite nested sequence of square roots, which looks exactly like X. So X equals square root of one plus X. Okay. Uh, sim real relatively, simple, relatively simple expression relatively simple equation. In a similar way, we can express the long formula with fractions as a combination of one plus one over exactly the same z. Or z equals one plus one z. If you re return here, that for some reason I claim that these two things are equal. Look at the equality sign between them, which is absolutely not obvious when we look at this expression. Let's go down, however, and observe that this is exactly one and the same equation. They both can be transformed to form one x squared equals one plus x, another one z squared equals one plus z, X and Z have to be positive because of their nature. Here, okay. And these two equations have the same roots. And it's easy to see that one root is positive, another is negative, and positive roots are, of course, equal. Because it is the same equation in both cases. Hence, we have the equal. Please notice a remarkable uh, thing. We proved that these two mathematical equations are equal without actually computing the value. Well, it is an easy exercise, just solve quadratic equation. But I do not care about that. They have the same hidden structure. Oh, good. I have to return it back to the how. Uh, push on mail, okay. Yes, this is how, okay, I have to learn. 
This so here I have a question, uh, Sasha. Yes. You say that they have the same hidden structure. Can you say something more about their structure to imply that they're equal? Yes, of course. Because their structure is expressed by these equations. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying uh, not with the equations, but uh, you know, if there's something that um, gives us these expressions, these infinite expressions that look alike from physics or nature. I mean, okay. If I had a pen working, I would uh, sketch your geometric explanation of the star in the language of elementary geometry, which is actually equivalent mathematically to this mathematical explanation. Maybe it's so. more, more uh, uh, natural for some people. I think but now you can open a blank page from your iPad and write on it. We will see that. Uh, I, do, I, I don't wish to, to try, sorry. Um, All right, so is, later I'm, maybe we will I, share. I, 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 I'm a lecturer with uh, 45 years of experience. And the rule number one, you never do experiments in the lecture. Okay, that's great. With the way how you write. You know, if something is working, stick to that. Okay, then stick to it. All right. <laughs> uh, my apology for that. No, no, we will share this afterwards as yes. uh, Okay, as so picture. golden ratio is uh, what we have. We have the positive root of uh, that uh, uh, equation x squared equals one plus x. This is a famous number, golden ratio or divine proportion. It appears in art, in architecture, in the natural world. I have no time to discuss the exciting subject, but basically this number appears everywhere because this is a square root of a simplest uh, quadratic equation which has no solution in radical. Uh, sorry, because no solutions in rational numbers, where irrational numbers appear. Another one, of course, is x squared equals minus one, which lead, leads to complex numbers. So very frequently, in my most important things in mathematics are the simplest. Typical example that fields of, uh, uh, fields of order two are much more important than fields of order three, because they are smaller and simpler. Well, I personally have a problem with fields of order two, but I'm not going to go into Everyone that. Everyone has problems with fields of order two. <laughs> yeah. However, the most precious gift from mathematics, ability to think mathematically. I would use the analogy between perfect thinking style and perfect swimming style. And again, I find myself in a situation when I simply do not know how to use iPad. How to copy this link? I don't think you can copy it from the PDF, but uh, you can try to hold on it. No effect. Okay, it is a pity. Okay, I will send the mail uh, later with the various, or put everything on the website somewhere with uh, various details, including this, uh, this thing. Okay. Total immersion file uh, style. Look at this uh, smaller picture here. Only one hand sticks out of water. The swimmer is entirely underwater. The natural question is how this is possible, how he can breathe. He can do that because of extreme precision of his uh, uh, movements. Sasha, I have to movement. stop you for a second. Yes. Uh, I actually sent the link to the video, Total Immersion Swimming video yes. of uh, the YouTube link to the live chat and the Zoom group chat. If you uh, see that, you can click on that. Ah, uh, yes, I've seen the link, but it disappeared from my screen. Yeah, if, if you go to Zoom on your iPad, 
You can uh, see the chat and iPad. you can click on. And, uh, it is difficult for me to go on Zoom on my iPad. All right. Then. Why, why I have to go to Zoom on my iPad and not on my laptop? Uh, well, I, I copied the link, so I, I thought you wanted to okay. open it from your screen sharing. Okay, I have to go to Zoom. Yes, where is Zoom? Yes. Share, share device video on, okay? Oh, on. So what's next? Uh, hit on more on the top right corner. Okay, I see. Uh, click chat. Okay, chat, yes. All right, you can click on the video now. Here. Yes. And it shows, yes? Yes, it is. And everyone can see it. Yes, if you hit play, everyone can see it. Well, I have to, to increase this thing. Yes, I muted it. Yeah, this is better. Uh, music is horrible, of course. But please notice the mouth is always under the level of water. Is it enough? I think so. Can we return? Uh, and this is from underwater, how it looks like. But he does does not breathe at the moment, and maybe he will make a uh, take a breath uh, air now. Okay, uh, I am returning back to my to uh, to to my Zoom. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, so where am I now? I uh, no stopped. return back to your mail. Uh, I have to return back to my mail. Okay, yeah. so I have to return back to my mail here. Yes. Yes. And uh, do you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. I can see it. Yeah, actually, I can control. Well, first of all, a few words which are frequently uh, used in mathematics for description of mathematical activity. Total immersion in the problem. Secondly, precision, the famous property of mathematics. Precision of movement secures ability to breath. The reason is that the, the body and the hands move in a way. So the some small whirl of is created around the head. And the swimmer can take air from this whirl. Economy of effort, it is remarkably relaxed and economical. Something which is never discussed in school classroom, unity of self-control and freedom, freedom of movements, freedom of swimming like that can be achieved only because of extreme degree of self-control. All that has direct analogies in mathematical thinking. Okay. Here I have to interlude. Uh, normally, self-control and freedom are considered to be two different things, two actually opposite things, but you say they support each other, right? Yes, they are not. You get full freedom only we have a high degree of self-control. Uh, we should have a talk on this, just, just this maybe another time. Okay, imagine a pilot of a plane. Okay, uh -huh. he cannot start dancing in the cabin. In the situation of a fighter uh, plane uh, pilot, where he has uh, no restriction how on how he, it flies, upside down, you know, in bizarre maneuvers and stuff like that. This is possible because he exactly knows what to do at every single moment and controls himself. 
I see that now. The same applies in mathematical thinking. That's great, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, one interesting thing that uh, skills of mathematical thinking are useful across many professions, uh, including those professions which do not exist at the moment. Mathematicians happen to be very re-educatable. They can learn a new area of technology which did not exist yet when they were at school. Normal people cannot. Well, I think you and I, you and I have proved this by using uh, these technology things that we have not used before no, no, for this maybe, live stream, right? Maybe I'm not that, you know, uh, uh, skillful in the whole thing. I'm sh I, I think you are. Okay. Uh, what mathematics is not? There is a popular definition of mathematics as a study of patterns. This is a definition for school teachers and uh, for school children and for lazy thinkers. Aha, we see a pattern. Look how it is beautiful. Popular texts about, about mathematics are full of this kind of rubbish. I try to demonstrate to you that mathematics is the study of structures behind patterns. At uh, uh, interviews for applicants to my mathematics department at Manchester University, I've frequently heard from my, uh, from people whom I interviewed, uh, you know, with uh, shining in eyes, oh yes, I love mathematics because mathematics is the life of patterns. And I advise them to look into a window at the building next to us, which has remarkable rectangular pattern of glass windows on the wall. And uh, ask him, you obviously see the pattern. Can you describe it? And I said, yes, it is a rectangular pattern, and blah, blah, blah. And then ask, and why? Why this specific pattern? Why not hexagonal cells, like in a bee uh, hive? And as a rule, people were unable to answer my question. And it is very simple. Because this pattern corresponds to the steel frame of the building, which carries all the structures. And which is built that way, is from repeated moduli, just because this is uh, makes it uh, easier to build. And again, uh, well, well, well. Again, I have to return back. I love, uh, I do not like definitions of mathematics. I like various descriptions of mathematics. One of these descriptions very recently was coined by my good colleague, Ro Rob Wilson. He uh, studied group theory and quite seriously. Mathematics solving tomorrow's problems yesterday. Actually, I did a bit of uh, applicable mathematics in my life. Uh, directly talking to engineers and uh, solving the problems which they encountered. Every time I did that, but just picking something already known in mathematics. Something which can be taken just from the shelf, literally. Quite a lot of modern, really modern application of mathematics, mathematics which is applied, is actually not so modern. It was thought to be unusable, unuse, unusable, useless, purely theoretical. But remarkably, a couple of centuries later, it finds applications in life. And that's serious applications. And now I'm turning finally to the promised uh, discussion of 
to promise discussion of uh, 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 mathematics education in Soviet Russia. Well, actually, I see this presentation and uh, your understanding of mathematics as a product of uh, your childhood mathematics oh, education. It is very much. I'm talking about specific strand of Russian mathematics education, quite prominent. I'm or I am a produced by this strand. This is so called Olympiad mathematics. Uh, mathematics which existed outside of schools in uh, various uh, not compulsory activities. And uh, I will not tell a lot about details how all this was organized, blah, blah, so, so, so on. I will try to do something uh, to explain something how which could mm, uh, perhaps uh, uh, explain the ideas behind that. Uh, this uh, tradition, this strand stream in mathematics education was founded in the first half of 19th century. Uh, essentially, we are coming closer, closer to uh, uh, a century from the time when it started. And it was founded by some of the greatest mathematicians uh, uh, in the world of the time, and not only of that time. I can, uh, I have to give much more names, but I do not have time for that. Actually, I do not have any time for details. But names are like Pavel Alexandrov, who is uh, one of the founders of algebraic topology, Andrei Kolmogorov, who, who is a founder of quite a lot of stuff. Modern probability theory, for example, <laughs> More, modern mathematical statistics and uh, functional analysis and uh, a lot of stuff in algebra, in logic, and uh, study of turbulence. He did it, interestingly. And Israel Gilfand, I had a, a I was lucky enough to, to meet him and work with him and write papers with him for some short period of time. So at least uh, one of these three are, is known to me personally. And if I will have time, I will maybe able to tell him something. Um, Basically, what they did, as I said here, they created a system of mathematics education and did that very much yesterday in the in, uh, first half of the last previous century. For nowadays, because nowadays what mathematics has to become I mean, mathematics education has to become if civilization wishes to survive. In short uh, formulation, what is important that in the, when the computers are coming and replacing men everywhere, mathematics has to concentrate on human activities and mathematics education, which cannot be done by computers. And so far, the only remaining area is creative thinking. This is the reason when mathematics education have to teach not uh, specific routine skills like uh, made computations of various kinds and blah, blah, but have to teach to think creat creatively. And there are some uh, traps in that concept. Because too many people think that, oh, oh creative mathematics, why do you have to, uh, to, to know how to multiply, to do long multiplication of number integers? Or operate with uh, expressions containing square roots? 
where in life it is used. Well, it is used only in one particular place. In mathematical thinking. All the skills are completely useless for people who will not be mathematicians, who will not use mathematics creatively. But they are absolutely necessary for people who want to be creative in mathematics. It is the same unity of self-discipline and uh, freedom. It is the same need for extreme precision in everything which you are doing. If you just think you know in a kind of uh, way, vaguely described, you're not a mathematician. You have to be able to check at any moment that what you are doing is correct, that it is precise, that it is supported by calculation. Interestingly, calculations which mathematicians do in this situation are not of the kind which can be routinely done on a computer. Nothing to say about uh, notorious what it's called calculator, yes. So just to be clear, are you suggesting that, uh, for example, the engineering maths we teach in the universities is unnecessary? It is necessary. I teach engineers, uh, but this math is uh, taught to them ext in an extremely bad way. They are taught how to look into a table, uh, to pick certain values of, say, some probabilistic distribution and substitute and make calculation on calculator. It is not understanding. Uh, they need, first of all, have deep understanding of that kind. And uh, Kalmogorov did very much practical in work for engineers. And, uh, and Gelfand uh, was involved in a huge amount of very practical engineering work. And they can do that at that level exactly because they were able to think as a mathematicians. Gilfand was a mathematical advisor of Andrei Sakharov, creator of a Russian age bomb. He worked with him on that. And he learned physics, he understood physics. So that could freely talk to physicists working on the project of creating of a, a nuclear bomb. So it is well confirmed that uh, uh, in history of engineering that some of the most dramatic breakthroughs in application of mathematics to engineering were done remarkably by uh, pure mathematicians. Okay. I can give a lot of examples. Or, okay, so uh, what you're saying is about the method of teaching the uh, mathematics people need, right? Uh, about also about content of this teaching mm -hmm. and principles of this teaching, indeed. The principle number one, the criteria for success of, te of a teacher is not students' performance in tests, but ability to think. In really high level uh, places of teaching, there are just half a dozen in the world. In high level places of teaching mathematics. Tests and exams as a rule oral. And take form of one-to-one -one chat between uh, student and teacher. It is not task of the teacher to check how a student calculates and whether he gets correct answer. Much more important to see how the student thinks, what kind of strategies he or she is using. 
uh, whether he is flexible enough, where he is prepared to uh, change approach to the problem is if the previous one apparently leads to dead end. A lot of, lot of these many things which simply never discuss in school, mainstream school mathematics, in mainstream uh, mathematics school education. So was it like this when you were in school? The, the school is mainstream, but you had some extra work, right? Uh, no, it wasn't that case. Uh, the, uh, the school was mainstream. I didn't have a, any extra uh, work. But at age 13, I suddenly was called to take part in mathematics competition. And this changed my life. I easily solved this competition and just discovered that problem um, were quite interesting. And after that, I noticed in the local bookshops some small booklets on this kind of thinking mathematics. And bought them because they were dirt cheap. I could easily use my pocket money. And, uh, and started to read them. And uh, eventually I went through entire system described by here. With the exception of mathematical circles, there were no in my life. Usually it happens in relatively uh, large cities. And, uh, uh, but mathematical competitions were present, abundant and really cheap books including very cheap small books on subjects which had no, almost nothing in common with standard school mathematics, which were accessible, very uh, lightheartedly uh, written and written by extremely good professional mathematicians. Then I got enrolled in every correspondence school which I discovered there were three of them and learned quite a lot of stuff from them. And, uh, and uh, again, I, some problems, some little book was written, sent to me by for reading and some set of problems. I have to solve this problem and send solution by, by, back by mail. And someone wrote very detailed comments in my solution. So. So there is a system of correspondence schools that uh, give you teaching and problems and tasks uh, from somewhere else, right? It's not your normal school that you registered oh, to? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, in uh, the Western world, the school as a rule stick to training for passing school examinations and maybe enter examinations at universities. This stuff uh, correspondent schools did not care about school curriculum, school exams of each other. They cared about mathematics independently of all that. Then specialist mathematics schools and eventually I got into a pretty selective specialist physics and mathematics boarding school. I went there. It suffices to say that there were high, how many students there? Oh, yes, there were only three top classes, well, oldest, uh, eldest classes of school age there. And uh, there were six, 600 of us. The catchment area from which students were selected covered territory with population of the time of 40, 40, 40 million people. And it was all uh, Siberia, Far East, what is now Central uh, uh, Asian Republics like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. And quite the big, big territory. Oh, sorry, I have to switch it off. Yes. My apologies. Uh, Okay, I killed it. Sorry, my apology. Okay, no problem. 
I, you are simply forgetting it. You know, when, when I'm in lecture theater, the first thing which I do with my phone, I demonstratively switch it off in front of all students. And That's the best way of reminding, I think. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, at home, I do not have this you know, automatic habit. Oh uh, yeah, th this is a new experience for all of us. So I think those are all acceptable. So we have a question about the um, correspondence school, Sasha. Can you explain a little bit more? Are they some uh, private institutions or publicly funded, John Ozan asks? They were publicly funded. And one interesting thing uh, is, uh, uh, well, they're funded, they were normally funded by universities, for example, and associated with some universities. One of them, which uh, of three schools, which I did, one of them was run by people from mathematics department of the Moscow University. Another one from the famous, mostly in physics, another one, from the famous, uh, Moscow Physical, Physical Technical Institute, which at the time was the best place to study physics in uh, Russia and maybe in the world. And my school was run by a peculiar university where I eventually was a student, Novosibirsk University. It is also was quite uh, exceptional in many uh, aspects. Actually, all of that was free. That's great. So, uh, yeah, with the exception of boarding school, for with boarding school you have to pay for boarding, but it was a sim symbolic pay. That's great. Uh, 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 in effect. Okay, so uh, can a normal ordinary school become a correspondence school, or these correspondence schools are something of their own? There was something on their own, just as normal school cannot do anything because it was bound by laws and regulations and orders from authorities. They have no, absolutely no freedom to do anything. Only very big and very independent universities, which were some small states in the state, could allow to run and coordinate these activities. Okay, I will tell more. Uh, in uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, it was a parallel, a kind of parallel stream, parallel world. It had a remarkably little interaction in many cases with the mainstream school. In my case, zero interaction with the mainstream school. Now we are talking about the uh, mathematics and physics boarding school you went to, right? Oh no! All these competitions, all these. Uh, uh, books, all these uh, uh, journals which published, and journals were published by with uh, mass print run. Okay, this is the yes. parallel yes. stream. Yes. I see. All that existed without touching uh, in any way secondary schools and mathematics there, and schools did not touch. As I, when, when, when I was, as I already said, that when I was a student at the schools, in three simultaneously. No one in my school knew about that. I just got enrolled. And, uh, and so later, when I was a student, I was actually take part in running uh, correspondence boarding school at Novosibirsk. So I knew it from both sides. I see. Yes. And uh, so it has to be emphasized that key role in all this for all, for all years of existence of the system since 1935. Uh, key role was played by professional research mathematicians. It was founded by professional research mathematicians. Uh, uh, books and booklets were written by professional research mathematicians. Well, there were others, but the one which really matters, uh, you know, the ones the, which really mattered, which really were interesting and exciting to read, were written by professional mathematicians, sometimes very young, very beginner researchers. 
In the specialist boarding school, mathematics was taught and physics. By uh, part time as a by professional researcher from academic institutes, whose day job was research in mathematics. And what is important, a child can be drawn in this system without no one, with the exception maybe of immediate family, being aware of that. All that was free. The natural question, where did money come from? Okay, we come to the end of the uh, prepared text. And so from now on, I start talking without uh, slides and yes, without any written record, <laughs> I wish to emphasize. I will be talking about politics. So uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to uh, cancel your iPad connection. Is that okay? Oh, yes, please. You can cancel so that people can connection. see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And All right. Let me back to norm. Yes. Okay. I do this big screen. Okay. Great. So I uh, intentionally speak uh, without record uh, because I will be speaking about things which are again not frequently discussed. Because what we had behind all that is a very interesting interplay of politics and serious politics actually with uh, and the ideology and also just uh, uh, brave attempts of mathematicians uh, to retain freedom, intellectual freedom under totalitarian regime. All that started is 1935, quite uh, grim times of uh, Stalin and the cruel, bloody dictatorship. And the uh, mathematicians started to do that because they were afraid that if they do not care about uh, bringing new generation of young, bright mathematicians into mathematics, they, themso they themselves will eventually become isolated and perish. For them, it was really a matter of survival. And uh, they managed actually to uh, get into some pact, unwritten agreement with the uh, political establishment of the country. That they will be quiet politically, but uh, will be enjoying freedom of doing what they want to do in their domain, in mathematics education. In particular, they managed to insist that they control selection of people into mathematics and later into uh, academic position, into sensitive position in the industry, in defense and security sector, and so, so on. But this is what they did. And they did. Kalmogorov and Alexander, for example, enjoyed remarkable freedom and in doing whichever they wished within mathematics. To the same degree, it could be said about Gilfand. And uh, they could set up, for example, first mathematics, boarding, uh, first mathematics correspondence schools, which was at least relatively cheap. You, you, you know it is just. And which was stuffed by uh, PhD students which did not get any money for that. Or, by the way, on part of mathematicians, all these competitions and uh, correspondent schools and blah, 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 as a rule, were unpaid voluntary activities. So how did they get their life with? Like they no. were working in the well, university? They were, they, they were paid for teaching at university, basically. And this correspondence schools were, were coming as a additional activities on top of that. There was a, some tradition of self-supporting, self-sustained system, which had to be self-supporting self and self-sustaining to decrease amount of 
control and pressure from the authorities. Okay, certain bits of authorities actually were quite friendly to mathematics, and these are were represented by the increasingly powerful uh, Soviet military industrial complex. They understood, and their leaders understood, that uh, to do a serious thing in this area, they needed good mathematicians. Good mathematicians, not just anyone. And so, yeah, so it was supported by the totalitarian regime also, right? Oh, yes. The totalitarian regimes have tendency to be, how to say, did not notice that mathematics could be something, you know, uh, uh, free. <laughs> <laughs> it was very easy to convince them that in mathematics, in theorem is proven it is theorem. It is theorem, okay? And uh, they could be easily be uh, and brief uh, hinted that actually it is like the leading the lead, the lead role of the Communist Party. What the party says, it is law. It is true. You know, it is necessary. The same as in mathematics. Well, uh, it is interesting that, uh, for example, mathematics was uh, the only science which apparently flourished in Albania during uh, the uh, Maoist regime there. And uh, so it is quite interesting. And so for that reason, and uh, when uh, Kalmogorov and Lavrentiev, Lavrentiev, another name which has to be mentioned here, he started in the purest of pure mathematics in descriptive set theory. I, I do not go into detail, but I would say that it is very abstract and as far away from any kind of application in his real life as possible. Perhaps even now. I think so, but, yes. But he at some point switched to engineering mathematics and became great expert in hydrodynamics of high pressures and high velocities of explosions, basically. And uh, did a big, great deal of work for the military and was a good friend. And in particular for that reason, uh, it was uh, a decree by the Council of Ministers in 1963 was uh, signed by, interestingly, not by, uh, Minister for Education of something, you know, but by the all-powerful Dmitry Ustinov, the head of the entire military industrial complex, legendary man. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, four boarding schools were created in Moscow, Leningrad, Novosibirsk, uh, and Kiev. And the school in Novosibirsk, when it was created, just from nothing. Actually, it appeared for existence before the formal decree was signed and published. Uh, it was housed in, um, remarkably, in a building which was built by the Soviet Army for the Political Military Academy, a place where political officers for the army had to be trained. For that reason, the opening of the academy was postponed and uh, a uh, very small school at the time, about 60 people, got huge building in their possession. It's just unbelievable. You know, kind of this is what I would call uh, policy priorities. So uh, there is a related question so i'm going to ask it actually there are more questions but uh big conversation starters so uh, i just want to ask uh, this one how was this free mathematics was affected by the collapse collapse of the soviet union uh, well it became a free mathematics elsewhere <laughs> a lot of mathematicians left the country well basically i left for that reason 
Technically speaking, I left uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed, but it was closely linked. And interestingly, for that reason, now in uh, America, for the United States, there is a strong tradition of mathematical circles and homeschooling, interestingly, teaching mathematics uh, to children in the family. Uh, there are different uh, streams in homeschooling in America. There is a, a, re, a, re, a re, religious right stream uh, where parents do that because they do not want their children to be uh, in a school introduced to sex and to theory of evolution. Yes, and there are educated people, mostly university public, uh, you, you university public, who just uh, who, who who are in despair of uh, American mainstream schools and specifically mathematics. There. In the second academic stream, uh, former Soviet mathematicians are quite prominent. They brought in some bits of this tradition. So. Uh the free mathematicians left there, and uh, what is left for Russia now? Some people. The competitions left, continue. Uh, some people left in Russia. Uh, some, some, some mathematicians are still in Russia. Uh, Russia now is a, a, a interesting place. <laughs> the schools are. <laughs> The schools in general are in serious declines. However, uh, mathematical classes in schools and the specialist mathematics schools exist in abundance. Now they are frequently actually quite expensive and uh, serve children of wealthy parents. And, uh, uh, and it is also now between uh, capitans of uh, big business there is a uh, understanding that they need not just arbitrary mathematicians, but only very good mathematicians. Extreme uh, manifestation of that is the recent development in Yandex, maybe you know the name of this company. Mm -hmm. It is a huge internet company and IT company uh, in Russia. They, in, they uh, brought one of the most famous schools, school number 57 in Moscow, into their corporate structure. It is uh, now uh, part of, uh, in fact, part of Yandex Group. It is very interesting. And this is done specifically because they want they already had their own uh, high education establishment uh, in computer science and computing. Uh, high level, very high level, very intensive courses. Now they discovered that they needed to have a steady supply of uh, 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 young bright people from the system. Uh, one of the uh, private universities in Moscow, Higher School of Economics, uh, runs a magistrate, MSc, Master of Science, or Magister uh, courses. Which are designed to uh, prepare teachers for specialist mathematics schools or for classes with uh, advanced level of mathematics education. In Russia now we have clear split between, uh, well, basically dead mathematics for the masses, which is taught simply because it is thought that it has to be taught. And uh, incorporation of this old Russian tradition of high quality mathematics for thinking people into elite education. 
It is a very interesting development. What I want to say, a few words now. What, what, what I want to say a few words in conclusion about all that. In Turkey, I witnessed and uh, seen development over at least 15 years, or maybe more, uh, of a kind of alternative stream in uh, mathematics education. It is represented by Ali Nisin and his uh, uh, mathematics village. Uh, and, uh, and of course, by our kind host, uh, Kubra, <laughs> who also is trying to do something in this domain. Uh, you know, at the first stage, uh, uh, simply because of personalities of people who do that, not for money, essentially, just for the sake of what is known as calling the English word, which means that you simply feel that you have to be someone, do something. Uh, to uh, teach some quality mathematics. And what I wish to comment that um, uh, so far you perhaps do not have a commercial competitors. Well, if, if you're talking about the village, I think, um, yes, there, there started some organizations, some um, people who try to build things like that and it's wonderful of course the main hope of mine was that uh, we have smaller villages all around turkey maybe even in the world uh, there is a professor from mexico um, a german professor who lives in mexico that uh, started trying to build something like nesson mathematics village in mexico uh, Okay, build as a for-profit enterprise. Uh, no, I mean just uh, for outreach in mathematics. Okay, okay, outreach. Okay, great. Uh, I very much hope that you will be successful in that. Hopefully. Uh, yes, but I have to warn that your success will breed uh, for-profit competition. I see. Now I understood what you said. Yeah, I, I think there are. Yes. Um, a month ago, I think, when I was able to go out, uh, I saw something. The first student village of Turkey, a commercial. Uh, there is a company. This is some kind of an enterprise, I think. And they built some village, of course, for money. You, you have to provide some money to go there, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, I more or less completed my talk. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I do so. want to overstay my, uh, my welcome, but if anyone would uh, wish to listen further uh, story, maybe next time, if I alive, which is always questionable in the modern environment. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I'll be happy to give a talk uh, explaining, uh, for example, with selection of mathematical problems, which will yeah, be yeah. in this uh, uh, alternative stream, and to explain how actually these uh, ideological political principles were reflected in choice of problems, in choice of themes, in choice of methods, and various other stuff, you know, why all that was so different? Actually, uh, there came some comment questions from uh, the live stream, um, mm -hmm. but the questions are big, like, uh, what is thinking? How do you think? How do you um, improvise your thinking, improve your thinking, or uh, questions like how you learned mathematics? But uh, since we have been here slightly more than one hour. I think we should say our goodbyes now and then uh, we you, can yes. plan another talk on thinking and mathematical problems. That, that will be great for me too. Okay, great. 
Thank you very much. Many thanks, Kubra. Many thanks, invisible audience. It is quite strange to teach uh, audience you do not see or tell something to audience you do not see. It is a rare experience for me. Yeah, hopefully okay. uh, at some point we will take the audience uh, inside this conference. They can raise hands and ask questions to you too. Okay, yes. We will improve our technology using you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much Thank for being much. with us here today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you later again. Yes. Thank you.